Dominic, thank you very much. It's always a, a pleasure to be in Dublin. Um, this is potentially a bit of a dry subject, having to talk about strategy and, and, and infrastructure, but I'll, I'll do my best to try and fit it into the context of some of the other things that we've heard about, and then just come back to why I've titled it, of whether thinking about dementia strategies is in fact just the, uh, the tip of the iceberg. Now, we just heard how valuable political support can be for dementia. And I think we have been very lucky compared with how dementia was 10 years ago. So in the UK, we've now, we, we, we actually changed governments quite quickly at the moment, but going back to four governments ago, we had a, a, a ministerial advisory group. And then the big push was when David Cameron um, used the G8, now G7 presidency to drive uh, dementia. I'm just going to be talking about the, the research component of that. But from that, we had the setup of the World Dementia Council, which is still in existence and it meets about twice a year. And it's a lot of that activity that pushed the World Health Organization to have a global action plan on dementia, which I think has been really powerful. And we also have a, um, what was a prime ministerial, but is still a government um, 2020 dementia vision, and that at the moment is being reviewed and hope very much that it'll go beyond and um, we'll have a 2025 vision. What I'm going to do is to run through some of the infrastructure that's been put in place. I think this is quite important because from the research point of view, you do need some continuity across the research environment, but what's been put in place? And I'm going to start because there's, we tend to think of a translational pathway from very basic research right through to implementation of health services. It doesn't really work like that. It's a lot more iterative, but we'll assume it's nice and linear. So we do now have a Dementia Research Institute, which is focused on basic biomedical science in neurodegeneration, particularly dementia. It also now is going to have a, a healthcare technology and engineering uh, component to it. And the, the hub of this is at University College London. The Medical Research Council um, put a lot of investment into the Dementias Platform UK. Now, we have a lot of cohorts in the UK, and we have a lot of birth cohorts. So birth co cohorts have been particularly valuable. So one that um, is based at UCL was everybody who was born in one week in 1946 in March. And they have been followed right through until they're now in their, in their early 70s. And so you've got early information, you've got information about their educational attainments and their life course. And so when we were talking earlier this morning about prevention, and about what one might do to prevent late life cognitive impairment, these are really valuable cohorts. And what the platform does is bring not only these birth cohorts, but a number of others um, together, and there's about two million people now in these, to try and understand how cognitive impairment may develop and to stratify it I, in terms of the precision of diagnosis, genetic stratification, and a host of other biomarkers. The next stage, I think, in the, in the research environment is embedding it into the clinical service. Um, we're not going to get anywhere without research. And research, offering research to people, having the mindset of all um, clinical workers that research is important is essential. And our National Institute of Health Research embeds research into the clinical service, into the National Health Service. And to set up a, a group, it's called Dendron, to represent dementia and neurodegenerative disease. And I'll come back to why I think a broader view than just Alzheimer's disease is important. But this covers um, the UK and there are networks in the devolved nations. And what you'll see in the... Uh, in this lower graph here is its slow progress, but gradually we are increasing the number of people who are in studies and the number of studies that are being funded and going on to that research portfolio. 
And supporting this, um, I don't have a slide showing it, is a, a network of clinical research facilities, because you might recruit people, you might do some of the research in our patients, but there's types of research where you do need dedicated uh, research facilities. And we mustn't forget what's going on in care homes. How do you deliver the best sort of care? And so we've set up a, um, a network of um, uh, enabling research in care homes is the ENRICH uh, acronym. And this is over 1,000 care homes who are interested in supporting and enabled to help with research. That all sounds very good, but we've got a problem. So if you look at cancer, about 20% of people at the moment um, with a diagnosis of a cancer are in some sort of trial. Now, that's a lot easier in cancer because the big questions now are what combinations of anti-cancer drugs treat which type of tumours, and we've got a lot of stratification in terms of different types of tumour at a genetic level. So when you're treating somebody and you're not quite sure whether to put A plus B plus C or B plus C plus D, you go into a trial. But of course, we don't have those sorts of um, interventional questions in dementia, but only 5% of people. When we started all this infrastructure, it was 1% of people with a diagnosis of a dementia were in research. But a couple of years ago, the Alzheimer's Research UK, uh, in a survey, identified that over 60% of people wanted to take part in research, but less than 20% had any idea of how you actually go about it. Um, and clinicians across the whole spectrum are not particularly good at talking about research. I personally find it quite difficult if I'm looking after somebody and I'm talking about looking after them, to then start talking about research. So we need, we need to get beyond that. And so what we've set up is what's called Joint Dementia Research. Um, and this is a public-facing portal that anybody with an interest um, can register their information. Now, what they essentially become are data donors. So they go on, they give information about themselves, information about their diagnosis, their interest in taking part in research, information like how far they prepared to travel, etc. Um, and they can do this through the charities online or, or, or by a form. And then in real time, at the back end, all the studies that have been ethically approved with their criteria, and they in real time match against the information that's given by the patient. So if I go on as a patient, there's a little list of about five or six studies perhaps that I'm matched to. And then I say, well, I'm quite interested in that one, interested in that one, tick on those. The researcher who goes in sees that I'm interested and I've given permission because I'm a data donor to be contacted. And what's very powerful about this, it creates a very important community of patients, the public, because a lot of these are people who are healthy older patients. And a lot of them are also people who are carers and some of them are young carers, but they're interested in research. It creates that community between the patient and public together with researchers, and it shifts the, the power basis. The reality is that quite often research groups can be quite protective of patients. Um, and so it depends um, on who you see as to what sort of access you get. So there's an equity of access to research issue here, which you can get past by having something like joint dementia research. And these are the um, figures at the end of last month. So there's nearly 35,000 people have now registered. As I said, a lot of those are healthy individuals or carers. Um, and about 10,000 of those have actually been uh, um, enrolled into studies. Um, and there's about 200 studies that are on the, uh, at the back end of this. So making some progress. Now, I was um, asked also just to talk briefly about um, the broader international context. I'm only going to mention one, um, and that's called joint uh, planning in neurodegeneration. Now, this was a, an EU in, a, initiative. If my voice becomes a little tremulous with emotion, it's because I'm still getting over Brexit. So you just have to bear, bear with me. 
But this has been a fantastic um, initiative. And what this has done is to um, bring together national strategies in a very light touch way so that a call will go out on a particular area. So we've had one recently about cross-disease mechanisms. And the national funding body will look at it and say, well, actually, that really aligns with our strategy. We'll fund our own researchers. So if Ireland was doing this and they're part of JPND and being major supporters of this, we'll say, oh, that's very much in our strategic vision. We will put in you know, 5 million euros to support any successful groups that we have in Ireland. And this really has been very successful and is being rolled out now to Canada, Australia, and Singapore look as if they're likely to come on board. And I just put this up because this provides you with <coughs> where the areas of interest are, but importantly, this is around neurodegeneration. I think we always have to remind ourselves that dementia is not Alzheimer's disease, but also in the degenerative dementias, there's a lot of overlap with other diseases like Parkinson's disease, like Huntington's disease, and we're learning a great deal. So some of the solutions are not going to come from just being very Alzheimer's disease focused. We do need to be much broader. I put up um, a slide at the beginning that said dementia strategies are just the tip of the iceberg. And I'll just bring this back more to some of the discussions, I think, that were happening this morning and, and more in line with brain health. And that is that I don't think we should just be obsessed with thinking what we should be doing to make sure that we don't develop severe cognitive impairment when we're 80. That's a really, really important question. A lot of lots going on in relation to that. But cognition is really, in a sense, a canary in the coal mine of health. And we all know that. Our cognition fluctuates all the time. I mean, I have good days and bad days. If I've got a viral illness, I'm not as good for a day. It tends to be even worse on a Monday compared with a Friday, but it's just not particularly good. And so I think we need to rephrase, and this is why I said is at the tip of the iceberg. So when we're talking about dementia, and dementia is politically, I think, a useful term, but it's, in some ways it's not a particularly helpful term. Um, it's like saying, oh, very severe heart failure, or, or you know, really nasty pain. It, it's a severity statement, and it tells us something about the number of different cognitive modules that are involved in cognition. But what we've got is early disease. A lot of evidence now that if we just think about Alzheimer's disease, you begin to see changes structurally, maybe 10 years beforehand. And if you, you probe, you do see very early changes. That's not dementia. That doesn't fit into our criteria of dementia, which is just this severe stuff. But there's a, a large burden of mild cognitive impairment out there. And ill health, if it's the canary in the coal mine, this is systemic poor health, and unfortunately, as we get older, we just acquire more things that, that go wrong. Then we've got medication. I, I think we ignore medication. Um, so many things that we take, and I'm not just thinking about the anticholinergic story that came out a couple of days ago, really do affect cognition. I, I had some nerve root pain and was put on a drug gabapentin. It, it really just wasn't good. Uh, but after a week, it all got better. But I had a week of not very good cognition. Injuries of all types. Poor education, that came up this morning. Stress, pollution, poverty, loneliness. These are all things, as we've heard, that can affect um, cognition. And what's important is, I think, to think about these throughout the lifespan, not only thinking about what's going to happen when we're 80, but a, lot, a number of those things are reversible, but depending upon the period of time over which they act, the area under the curve, they can have a significant impact. I, I was brought up to believe neurocysticercosis, a uh, parasitic infection that is particularly associated with poverty, 
in um, low, low income countries, you don't get uh, dementia. You don't get dementia, but you certainly get cognitive impairment. If, all you, if you get a 5% hit on cognition at the five years of age when you get your neurocystisocosis, even if you don't survive at 60 to get outside this disease, the area under the curve is significant. And I think we need to start thinking much more um, about those sorts of issues around cognition and to try and move that on. A colleague, um, Martin Knapp at the London School of Economics, and I proposed a cognitive footprint that would just look at these and try and measure the area under the curve. And so you do have to think about many of these different issues. We, this is here's neurocystisocosis, childhood malaria, big cause, HIV. When we talk about dementia, we often just think about this late, late life Alzheimer's disease, but the, the dementia, the cognitive impairment associated with HIV in sub-Saharan Africa is substantial. And so we need to include these other disorders. We talked about education. We heard a bit about epigenetic effects. And it's not just in utero. If, if your parent has been exposed to environmental stresses, um, then that does get carried over in those epigenetic mechanisms we heard about into the next generation. And it might even be that the sins of our grandfathers um, are upon us because uh, there's some evidence of uh, famine during um, the Second World War that suggests that this may be quite a long-term effect. And so in terms of modeling this, I think we just need to be a little, we, we, we should be able to quantify some of this. So if one takes cycling, that should be great. It's healthy, it'll have a positive impact. So the exercise story isn't just about what's gonna happen in 50 years time. Your cognition is better during the time you have more regular exercise and it drops off when you don't do it. So it's the area under the curve again. As long as we, um, as long as we have crash helmets, that's good. We've got to trade off head injury against the, against the benefit of the exercise. I cycle in London, so I love these sort of pictures. So you've got to, got to deal with the pollution issue. And I still don't know what I was supposed to do when I was going along this cycle lane. So it, it's, some of it's good, some of it's bad. We should begin to be able to quantify it. I'm mindful of time, so I think there was only one more slide. It takes a little bit of time to go into that. But I think just as a, an overview of where I think the, the research environment um, now is getting to the stage that we really can begin to move things along is important. It does need to be a partnership um, between public, patients, and the researchers. But I do think we should avoid being too focused on somehow stopping Alzheimer's disease. There's a much bigger challenge, which is around global uh, brain health. And I'll stop there. So what I'd like to talk to you this afternoon about is <coughs> creating a frame of hope in Ireland on dementia, um, why this is important, and um, how we might go about doing this. I mean, there have been a number of strategic initiatives over the last five years, um, the Understand Together initiative, which is part of the, uh, dementia, it's the dementia Awareness Campaign, which is part of the dementia, National Dementia Strategy, the formation of Dementia Neurogeneration Network Ireland, which is an interdisciplinary group of researchers which are coming together to try and raise awareness and prioritisation of research uh, in the area of dementia. And you heard this morning from Ian Robertson about the Global Brain Health Institute, which is um, it's a collaborative effort between TCD and UCSF in California. The idea is to train up future world leaders in the whole, whole area of brain health and dementia prevention. And these organizations and groups have come together really in Headspace, which is this public engagement uh, initiative uh, coordinated and curated by Dominic Campbell. And I really think this together, the, these initiatives really speak to creating a framework of hope uh, around dementia in Ireland. Uh, I'm primarily a clinician, I'm involved in research and in a lot of research for the last 30 years, but primarily we're taking care of patients and, and uh, families affected by dementia. And one of the things that struck me down through the years to me, in dealing with a person with dementia, with their families, was the importance of hope. And even though it's a very, very difficult situation, disclosing a diagnosis of dementia or Alzheimer's disease, 
always struck by how important it is to try and instill some degree of hope around that time, so that when the person and the family leave, there's a sense that perhaps something can be done. It's a very difficult situation, but something can be done. And many times, uh, people, families will come back to me years later saying you know, something that, that I said perhaps or wasn't really aware of at the time really seemed to make a difference and really the key part of what you say or what you impart to the individual or the person at the time that seemed to make a difference was something around the sense that, that there was some hope with the diagnosis. And that really has kind of influenced my thinking around this, the idea of hope in dementia and trying to create some form of framework around it. Because when you think about dementia, the diagnosis of dementia, most people think that this is something that is without any hope. And we continually hear the, the tragic narrative about dementia, the very high numbers of people affected by dementia, the burden, the costs. And you know, when you look at the media, uh, it again, the, 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 the tragic narrative is, is emphasized, um, bad things about dementia, and in a sense, when you, people were experiencing this, uh, going through the journey of dementia, people, families who were actually uh, walking, walking uh, through this with, uh, with the patients, with, with people with dementia, I mean, this can in a sense, cor have a corrosive effect. It can, can increase a sense of hopelessness. And I think this is quite negative. So really what we have is, kind of, uh, what I would say, the irrational pessimism around dementia. Um, and what I think we should be trying to do or talk about and have a conversation about uh, uh, is around trying to create a, a framework of hope or still some degree of a, a culture of hope based on evidence. And I think that there are some positive messages out there, but we're not really getting them out enough. So this is about creating a framework of culture of hope to make a difference in the quality of life of people with dementia. So be before I talk about what I consider to be a framework, I'd like to just talk about the concept of hope. And hope is both an emotion, but it's also a way of thinking. So there are two parts, the thinking part and an emotional part. And when you look at the thinking part, the thinking part is more operating under a, a conscious system. So uh, hope is about having uh, motivation, uh, uh, motivation to achieve particular goals, but also having a pathway that you can achieve these goals. So this conscious part, the thinking part of hope, is having the will, the motivation, the agency, but also having a pathway for action. The, the emotional part uh, of hope this, this is, is harder to define. Um, and it's more a sense of caring, trusting, feeling that people are looking out for you. It's to do with the relationship. It's harder to quantify or measure. And there are, there are a lot of factors that can have a bearing on it. And sometimes, um, a person with dementia may feel hope or experience hope, the emotion of hope, partly because of family members, but also it can relate to the experience they have with people uh, in the community. It can uh, be related to their uh, interactions with healthcare providers. Now, there's a difference between optimism and hope, to my mind. Uh, optimism is a sense that you know, the future will be successful no matter what, and you have a lot of optimists out there. But hope is really that there's a, a there's potential to secure a better future through your own motivation and through your own agency. And, and a crucial aspect of hope is, is really that it comes more into play when there's a lot of uncertainty. And of course, with dementia, there is a lot of uncertainty. With cancer, there's a lot of uncertainty. But in these conditions, it's really hard to say what exactly is going to happen. So hope is really more important in a situation where there's a lot of uncertainty as operates uh, in the situation that we see uh, for people with dementia. And there are many benefits of hope um, from the point of view of uh, the person's well-being and, and also in terms of their behavior. So we know that if people are hopeful, they feel less anxious. I mean, you actually can see a um, decrease in, in um, activity in particular brain areas on these MRI scans, these activation MRI scans. In people who are hopeful, the, in the areas that generate anxiety in the front part of the brain, these areas are less active, where people are more hopeful. Um, also, when people are hopeful, they tend to do better uh, on performance tests and exams. 
Also, um, younger people with diabetes, for example, tend to stick to their medications more if they experience hope. And people, if they are hopeful, they tend to more uh, apply themselves to uh, preventive programs. And this could be relevant to, to brain health and dementia prevention. And of course, a, a really fundamental, crucial aspect of hope is that it's really important if you're trying to adapt and cope with illness. And uh, particularly, I would say, with an illness like uh, dementia. Now, as part of the um, uh, Understand Together, this is the uh, uh, National Dementia Awareness Campaign, we were conducted uh, focus groups and also surveys uh, before we started developing the messaging around um, this campaign. And 1,300 people were sampled and also a lot of uh, stakeholder focus groups. And what we found was that there was a very high level of fear, a lack of knowledge, a lack of awareness uh, about dementia, particularly when you compare it to uh, heart disease and cancer. And also family members um, and people with dementia, there was a great sense of uh, loneliness and isolation, even a sense of isolation sometimes from friends and from society, um, and, and, and indeed from their own families. So there was a lot of fear out there when it came to uh, dementia, and again, our surveys and the focus groups uh, show that here in Ireland. And this is obviously something that's very widely known. T dementia, Alzheimer's disease, is very much feared, particularly in people over the age of 50, much more so than uh, cancer and stroke. Uh, the level of fear about uh, dementia tends to go up with age, it doesn't go down. And this fear is often driven by a lot of the bad news stories that we hear about. Uh, drug companies cutting out of, of funding uh, uh, research studies because of negative results. There's a sense that there are, um, there's no treatment. Um, and also we hear about uh, the, the effect that dementia has on a person's sense of identity, loss of independence, and their uh, capacity to, to cope with everyday activity. So again, a very, very much a negative uh, narrative out there. And this, of course, generates more and more fear. And fear can cause paralysis and inhibit action at the individual level, the person who has dementia or the family members, but also the collective level of society. It can paralyze society at this level of fear in terms of actually feeling that we can do anything about this condition. So this brings me to this idea around creating this uh, create, create, uh, framework of hope around dementia. And a framework is really a supporting structure. And what we want to do is put some form of supporting structure or framework in place at multiple levels both the personal and the caregiver level, at the healthcare professional level, at the research level, at societal level, trying to define pathways by which people can be directed through so they can achieve particular goals, raise the level of hope that they experience at an individual and across society level, and, and hopefully change the whole uh, narrative around uh, dementia. So let me just first of all take the individual, uh, uh, at the individual level, and the importance of hope for the person. And at the time of diagnosis or disclosure, the experience of hope will decrease anxiety and fear around the diagnosis, because as, you, as I'm sure many of you have, have had this experience uh, as a family caregiver or somebody who knows somebody with dementia, going in for a diagnosis is associated with a lot of fear. It really is very, very important to have some level of hope coming out there, because hope can facilitate a positive action. So in, in terms of some of the messages that can be transmitted and transferred to the persons of the family, there are things that you can do. Obviously there are some difficulties with the diagnosis and what the diagnosis brings, but there are things that we can do. And then hope can help with the sense of, of, of being able to participate in life but also adapt to the illness. And also if the caregiver is experiencing hope, they also can transmit that sense of hope to the person. Again, that emotional hope that can be important in terms of helping that individual be motivated uh, to adapt. What about at the uh, healthcare professional level? Well, one of the problems with healthcare professionals is there is, is there, a, there is a strong uh, level of therapeutic denialism in the sense that there is no hope, there is very little that we can do. And you know, when you talk to healthcare professionals, they, they, they perceive there isn't uh, access to treatments out there. Um, and there aren't very good treatment options. And they tend to focus more on safety issues rather than enabling the individual with dementia to do things. Of course, that also, that interaction has negative effects with, on the person with dementia because they feel that things are being taken away from them rather than, than being enabled to do things. And again, as healthcare professionals, we can have this professional blind spot because I think with that, we can experience the loss of empathy and not being able to uh, put ourselves in the shoes of the person with dementia. 
And it, you know, if we're not able to do that, if we don't experience that empathy, we're not going to be able to transmit and transfer any message of hope to that individual or to his family. So for healthcare professionals, I think it's important that they understand that there are some positive messages, hopeful messages that can be uh, given to people with dementia that are based on evidence and on experience. I'd just like to, 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 to put out some of these messages of hope based on evidence that can be uh, uh, given to people with dementia around the time of diagnosis. So it's important to realize that you know, there are many different forms of dementia, there are different types of dementia. Some of the dementias are, are amenable to treatment and intervention. Uh, Martin was, was alluding to this earlier on. I mean, even in a person with dementia, particularly late life dementia, there are potentially modifiable aspects. People can have medical uh, comorbidities, frailty, there may be vascular risk factors, hypertension. Medications in particular may actually affect the disease trajectory. People may be, if they have a getting a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease or dementia, perhaps they're drinking too much and they can cut back on that. Sometimes people with a diagnosis of dementia have behavioral psychological symptoms. These can be addressed and treated uh, and it can improve the quality of life of the person with dementia. Uh, also, uh, there's a constant, an idea that, out there that people with dementia, they're always going to go down here, they're always going to go down here rapidly. This is not always the case. Uh, there are variable trajectories uh, with regard to dementia. And you heard this morning about cognitive reserve and, and brain reserve. There can be inherent variability in brain reserve. Um, and, um, and people don't always necessarily have a very rapid or steady downhill trajectory, depending on the type of dementia, or even with Alzheimer's disease, it can be quite variable. And finally, you know, it's very important to, to, to say that we often underestimate the quality of life that people with dementia have. This was alluded to this morning. Now, as we look into it, we may think, you know, it's, it would be terrible to have dementia and Alzheimer's disease. But imagine if our society were more welcoming, engaging, and, and, and supportive, it might not be so bad. And most of the time, when people are in the experience, um, they actually don't see it the way we necessarily would see it. There's also a very positive message in terms of risk reduction. I mean, one thing we found in our survey uh, in the Understand Together campaign was that people in Ireland have very little about potentially modifiable risk factors with dementia. And again, as a healthcare professional, you can give quite a positive message to people coming in worried about their risk of developing dementia, particularly if they're a family caregiver of somebody with dementia. So we know that treating high blood pressure and uh, this rhythm disturbance atrial fibrillation can decrease the risk of stroke and post-stroke dementia. Uh, it looks now like if you treat midlife hypertension, you may reduce the risk of people getting Alzheimer's disease. We also know that older people who are at risk of cognitive decline, if you really do address vascular risk, increase the exercise, address the diet, and cognitive training exercise, this does appear to decrease uh, cognitive decline perhaps not decrease the risk of dementia, but at the moment it certainly does seem to decrease cognitive decline. But certainly addressing these modifiable risk factors is a very good idea. And I think we should be ambitious about this prevention and uh, efforts and advise people who um, ask about this and advise people to do this in their life. Now I just want to come to two other areas before I finish. One is the area of research and um, Dementia and Neurogeneration Network, Ireland, which is this interdisciplinary group uh, of researchers, really, which are trying to raise the profile, raise the prioritization of research in this area, because there is underfunding of research in dementia here in Ireland. We heard about the United, the United Kingdom, which I think has come a long way, certainly in the last five to seven years, and we would like to, to see developments in that area as, as well. It is about one euro per person is the population spent on research in dementia in Ireland at the moment. I mean, it's very hard to assess the amount, but it's about one euro. So we'd like to see that increase significantly. Research needs to be part of policy and strategy. And one of the problems we've had is that uh, I think that there's been a lot of these silos. Uh, we need to join up um, the, the different interprofessional groups and not just have uh, sort of basic clinical and, and health service research or, or psychosocial research, we need to join it all up and, and have a united front. Again, there's a problem with sometimes uh, research and science thinking in terms of unreasonable certainty that if we stick to what we know, we'll really find the cure, we find, uh, we find a way forward. In fact, we need to broaden our ideas and we also need to engage with advocacy and with people as I mentioned themselves, this patient uh, public uh, involvement this is really, really crucial to inform our research. But research can provide hope, uh, it can help improve the quality of life, 
and care of people through new developments, but also very importantly, participate in research is a pathway. It is a pathway that can raise the level of hope. And I find many, many times people involved in research, they get a lot out of getting involved in research, not just from the point of the potential that something might, uh, uh, might work, um, not necessarily for them but for other people, but actually the involvement in research, the sense of purpose that we talked about this morning, the sense of involvement, uh, there's really, really huge benefit in that participation. So this, we're going to talk later about the DNNI, but I think I just want to highlight what DNNI is focused on, six main goals, but raising the priority of research, raising public awareness about research is really what's crucial. And what we'd like to see, as in the UK with joint uh, dementia research, is that just like you should be able to signpost what's available in terms of services um, for people with dementia and their caregivers, we should be able to signpost what's available in terms of research and we should be encouraging as much participation and collaboration as possible. And in that way to chip away at this monolith through research. And these are just some examples of some of the, the positive aspects of research that are ongoing in Ireland at the moment. Finally, I just want to come to the Understand Together campaign and really how this campaign is, is, is trying to raise uh, hope through increasing awareness and community activation. And really, in a sense, it's a call out to the public. But what we're trying to do with this, with this last phase of the awareness campaign is to create community activation, which will map out a whole series of pathways for people with dementia. Uh, again, that they will be able to get activated, be able to have options to go into these community pathways that will raise uh, hope through being able to have them involved, engaged, uh, and appreciated uh, by society. And again, from the messaging and from the ads that you would have seen in, uh, on the TV, but also heard on the radio, it's about creating a lot of these pathways for hope in terms of activation within the community, exercise, social engagement, um, creative engagement, as, as what we're trying to do here today. Again, these are hope pathways that will help uh, people with dementia and family members stay engaged and be valued by society. And again, these are some of the, uh, the, the ads which tell real life stories. They're quite inspiring and they're very, very hopeful. But they're, 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 they show people who have motivation, uh, who are actually pushing themselves down pathways uh, to achieve goals. And again, in that way, I think they are maintaining their level of hope. We've already shown uh, some improvement in terms of the level of awareness over the two years from this campaign. There was a baseline survey done, and now two years later, uh, a follow-up survey. The understanding is up. Uh, the idea that people, it's a, uh, the, the general public can now do appreciate that people with dementia seem to be, can participate and, and can have interests. And, and also, there's a greater awareness among the general public now of, of uh, potentially modifiable risk factors. Now, you see these are small impact percentages, but uh, I think with the campaign being sustained, this is only going to increase, so it's hopeful. So, again, just to summarize, I think we want to move away from the fear to hope. There are different levels uh, from the individual, the healthcare profession, through research and society. We can create these pathways, raise the level of hope, and change the whole uh, perspective and the narrative around uh, dementia in Ireland. Again, just to summarize, you can see different goals, different pathways, important messages uh, for the person, for the healthcare profession, for the research uh, 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 groups, and also for society in general. But if we build together this framework and work together cooperatively, I think we can have an impact on hope, instilling a culture of hope which will actually I think ultimately improve the quality of life for people with dementia here in Ireland. Just finally, just to, to leave you with a quote from is a palliative care physician who was really speaking about hope with respect to um, end of life care and people with cancer, but I think it equally applies to dementia. And really, uh, what she's saying here that it's important sometimes to, to fall in with the patient, to fall with the patient. Um, uh, as part of this empathic response, uh, 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 but I'm just reminded of fall together, stand together then, and understand together, which is really about raising awareness, raising hope. And I, suppose, I hope that we can all get together uh, in, in, I suppose, promoting and creating this framework as we move forward over the next few years. Thank you very much. <laughs>